Adventures in Research. Now you better climb again and... Hey, hey, pull her up, Joe. Here comes a piece of mountain. It's okay, Mike. We missed it. Just missed it. Hey, Mike. Well, for gosh sake, the guy passed out cold. This is Paul Shannon introducing another in the series of programs dealing with the thrilling adventures to be found in the field of scientific research, as told by the men of science themselves. Today's chapter by Dr. Phillips Thomas, research engineer of the Westinghouse Research Laboratories, is titled Electronics in Transportation. This is the story of men on the move and the electronic devices that guide them swiftly, safely on their way. It is the story of transportation and the remarkable part electronics has played in it. Far to the north, a great field of glacial ice shimmers in the crisp, cold air. The roaring of the wind, the hammering of the waves are dimmer beneath an ominous rumble that swells to a roar as it grows. Tons of blue-white ice, solid as Gibraltar's rock, are splitting away from the field to crash with a booming splash into the sea. An iceberg is born. A floating, ghost-like hulk. Most of its ponderous bulk submerged beneath the frigid water. Drifts out with the shifting tides, bearing south to the great Atlantic Ocean, south across the lanes of traffic to menace the precious hulls of cargo carrying life-bearing vessels. In packs or just as often quite alone, the iceberg waits, a frozen, floating mountain. Waits as she waited that April night in 1912 in the path of the new giant of the ocean, the steamship Titanic. I think it is only proper, before we leave this fine salon, to thank our good friend, the purser, for arranging for us to use it. Indeed, we must certainly be duly grateful for so many things. The calm, lovely weather we've enjoyed. The smooth grace of this, this mammoth liner. It is fortunate that she has been so blessed on this, her maiden voyage across the sea. And we travel secure in the steadiness of her in her strength. It is good to know that we sail on a ship that is unsinkable, safe from all. Ah, uh, good evening, Captain Smith. Mm, Mr. Lightoller, I thought I'd look in on the bridge before I retire. All's well? All's well, sir. Lookout's been instructed to keep a sharp eye out for icebergs? That he has, sir. Well, we should be getting close to the section where they were reported to be. With a smooth, oily sea like this, as you wrote, with this one running tonight, sir, they'll be hard to spot. Yes, I know. Just as bad as running in a fog with icebergs to contend with. The blasted things take on the same dark coloration as the sea. Well, just be sure to keep a sharp watch. Pass the word to Mr. Murdoch when he relieves you. That I will, sir. He's due on at four bells. I'll be sure to speak to him about it. Very well. Good night. Good night, sir. Calm, oily sea, a sky packed with stars, a night so clear, so black as to swallow up the icy monster lying ahead. And then from the crow's nest high above the bridge, that bell shattering the velvet night with a hammered warning, obstacle dead ahead. Kitchen, start with the helm, hard! First officer Murdoch. Crow's nest reporting. Iceberg, sir. You're, you're bearing a little, but she's coming on fast. Yes, yes, I can see it now. We can't miss it, sir. She'll strike starboard. Somehow I've asked the foreman. Reports from below indicate things are bad, sir. She's ripped wide open, shipping water fast at the head. We didn't have a chance, Captain. Have your officers give the alarm to all passengers. Order them on deck with life belts. But don't arouse their fears. I'm going to the Marconi room. We've got to get out a distress call at once. 
Out across the lonely water went a mission of mercy, tense, loyal fingers pounding the shiny brass key. CQD, all stations attend, disaster. The Olympic sister ship of the Titanic heard the call and answered, but she was 560 miles away. The Baltic, 300 miles off, heard the call. So did the Parisienne and the Virginian, the Burma and the Mount Temple, and the German craft, the Frankfurt. 58 miles away from the tragic scene, the Carpathia heard the plea for help, and all began a race against time and the sea. But closest of all, the Californian, only 12 miles off, continued on her way. For wireless was something new, no standard life-saving requirement, and her operator was off duty for the night. The unsinkable Titanic plunged headlong to the bottom of the sea to take a thousand lives along. And when the survivors landed at New York on the rescue ship Carpathia, Mark Coney, whose wireless made their rescue possible, was on the dock to greet them. Yes, Mama. He was there on the dock when the Carpathia steamed in. I saw him myself. I saw the great Signor Marconi. Never in all my days of working on the docks have I gotten such a thrill. I can see it still in my mind. The survivors, as they pour down the gangway, they see him. They recognize him. They cry, we owe our life to you. It's true, Mama. If it were not for Marconi's wireless, they would all be dead. Dead. Man was not satisfied to travel on sea and land. The wings of the Wright brothers took him into the sky, gave him new speed and new hazards, too. No icebergs up there to block his path. But mountains have peaks, and they are high. No waves to pound his craft or swamp it. But air can be as rough, and currents as treacherous. Closer to the stars by which a man can find his way, except for fog. And then, in those early days of flying, when airmail stamps were something new on envelopes, there was nothing, nothing at all to go by. How you doing, Joe? Yeah, not so good, Mike. Wish I hadn't started out on this trip. This fog doesn't look like it's going to break. This is a bad place to get off course. Too many mountains. Better keep plenty of altitude. Yeah, I'm trying. Can't get above it. Can't see through it. Oh, if we just get a break. Well, how long has it been since you lost sight of the railroad? About 15 minutes. Hey, wait. There's a break in the fog. Let's make for it. Uh, no use, Mike. All I saw was a lot of nothing. Now we're in the soup again, and we've lost altitude. Oh, you better climb it. Hey, hey, pull her up, Joe. Here comes a piece of mountain. <sighs> it's okay, Mike. We were lucky. Just missed it. Well, don't worry. I know where that mountain belongs now, and I'll stay above it till it clears. Hey, Mike. <laughs> well, for gosh sake, the guy passed out. Cold. That's how it was. Give one of those pilots a landmark and he was all right. Just as long as he could look below and see a river or a brightly painted barn or two or a railroad track or a high mountain he was far enough away from. Today, though, it's different. Look into the pilot's compartment of a huge modern luxury liner of the air. While the passengers relax in comfort and safety... Safety made possible by electronics. The pilot sits there, radio phones clamped to his ears, watching dials and instruments and panel lights, and listening. Chicago Control, calling Flight 407. Come in, please. Flight 407 to Chicago Control. Go ahead. Ceiling here is zero. Repeat, zero. Do not attempt landing. Proceed along north leg of range to Detroit control. Weather at Detroit lifting. Go ahead. Flight 407 to Chicago control. Position 7214. Altitude is 7,000. High up there in the foggy night, the pilot gets his instructions by radio. Here's in his headphones the continuous hum of the radio beam and rides the roadway it paves for him through the sky. A roadway broadcast from ground stations dotted all along his route. 
Transmitters directing a beam of radio waves that marks his course through blinding fog. No light could penetrate. And when he says to his co-pilot... Check the compass, Tom, and let's take a fix. That means turn on the radio compass and find out our exact position up here in this murky sky. A special antenna on the plane revolves, picks out a radio station at a known spot, and the compass, there on the instrument panel, connected to the turning antenna, points straight to the station. The co-pilot tunes in another station. The compass points it out. Then by drawing lines on a map from those two compass points to the place where the lines cross, the co-pilot gets his exact position. Got it. We're right on the nose. Should be in touch with Detroit Radio Tower in 15 minutes. And out of the foggy night that blankets the airport, your sleek, wet transport follows a radio beam to the firm safety of the concrete runway. Radio is the seeing eye of the airways. Electronic devices are serving the rails, too, putting the block signals right in the cab with the engineer. Someday, they may automatically warn of obstacles ahead, even stop the train mechanically to avoid collisions. Traffic signals for your car may come right into the dashboard by electronics. And this... A car crash on the highway may be history when radar gets to work on our autos. Radar, an important development of World War II. Radar swept the skies above England and stopped the German Luftwaffe in its tracks. That was in 1940 and 1941. Radar works on the principle of reflection. Put a mirror in the path of a ray of light, and it will send the ray back where it came from. Send out the proper kind of a radio wave, concentrated in a beam, let it strike an object in its path, and the object will reflect the radio beam back where it came from. Complicated? Heinrich Hertz knew radio waves could be reflected as long ago as 1886. Marconi knew it in 1922. Yes, but it took a lot of men and a lot of research to make it what it is today. If only we could have known in 1912 what we know now. Can't you just see the giant Titanic on her maiden voyage, no longer blind to the lurking icebergs? Ah, oh, good evening, Captain Smith. Mr. Lytell, I thought I'd look in on the bridge before I retire. All's well? All's well, sir. There's the iceberg picture on the radar scope, Captain. The warnings were right enough. Hmm. Yeah, looks like quite a field of them. This one here is the nearest to us. Looks like it's right on our course. Mm -hmm. Does it that? Better alter your course a little. Just a little. And keep an eye on the scope. Check the course with the radio loop and have Sparks confirm that iceberg report by radio. Well, you won't be needing me for anything more, Mr. Lightoller. I think I'll turn in. Right, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. And like the liners of today, guided, protected, blessed by the marvels of electronics... The ghost of the luxury ship Titanic glides into the night. And there you have the story of electronics and transportation, inseparable partners in the march of civilization, products both of mankind's never-ending adventures in research. This has been another in a series of stories by Dr. Phillips Thomas, research engineer of the Westinghouse Research Laboratory.